preparing now. And we are live. Good evening. My name is Scott Harris. I'm executive director of museums at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to a program by one of our university museums, the James Monroe Museum. And tonight's discussion, uh, which we've been looking forward to for some time, is of slavery in the president's neighborhood, a research initiative of the White House Historical Association that seeks to provide better context and understanding of the roles played by black persons, enslaved and free, in and around the White House. Before I introduce our guests, I want to thank the sponsors that make possible all of the public programs that are presented annually by the James Monroe Museum. The Fredericksburg Savings Charitable Trust, the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, which is administered by our good friend, Trustee Walter Sheffield, the Stuart Jones Charitable Trust, and the Friends of the James Monroe Museum. We appreciate the contributions of all of these fine folks. I also remind our audience on Facebook Live that you may submit questions for our guests throughout the conversation in the comments section to the right of your screen. Our public programs coordinator, Lindsay Crawford, who is administering the live broadcast, will collate these and pass them on to me so that I can pose them to our speakers. I promise that we will get to as many as possible, uh, as many as our time allows, and we do ask that you make your questions as succinct and on topic as possible. And now I'm pleased to welcome our speakers from the White House Historical Association, historian Lena Mann and senior historian, Dr. Matthew Costello. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to the Monroe Museum for having us. Uh, my name is Lena Mann and I, as, as has been said, work as a historian at the White House Historical Association. And uh, I just want to dive right in. I'm going to talk first, and then my colleague Matt is going to talk um, after me. So let's get started. Um, so in uh, February of 2020, the association launched our Slavery in the President's Neighborhood initiative. Uh, and this initiative tells the stories of the enslaved and free African Americans that built, lived, and worked at the White House, um, as well as uh, in surrounding homes on Lafayette Park and in the greater Washington DC area. And we found that, of course, while there are a few written accounts of enslaved people's experiences, their voices can be found in letters, newspapers, memoirs, census records, architecture, and oral histories, really a wide variety of sources. Um, so by connecting all of these details, uh, the association has sought to return these individuals to the historical forefront by intertwining their lives, the stories of their lives with the president's first ladies and first families. Uh, next slide. So to start out this research, the association, uh, we took a closer look at presidents that relied on enslaved labor at the White House. But in addition to talking about slavery at the White House, um, we also expanded out that research to look at slavery uh, in the surrounding president's neighborhood. And since many people think of the White House as a symbol of democracy, um, it's really important to remember that it has this really complicated past and there is this paradoxical relationship that exists between slavery and freedom, um, not just at the White House, but in the broader nation's capital and the United States at that time period. So in order to share our research with the public on this topic, um, the association launched an accompanying website. And I just wanted to take a quick minute to show you uh, some of the features. So this page right here is what the homepage looks like. Uh, next slide. And as you click into the site from the homepage, you will find a number of resources, including an index of all the known enslaved individuals that worked at the White House. Uh, we have a section for frequently asked questions, um, also a section for additional resources about the slavery and the presidency. And then finally, a virtual tour of the historic slave quarters at Decatur House, which is uh, the only known existing urban slave quarters within sight of the White House. Next slide. Um, in addition to all these resources, the main feature of this initiative is uh, an interactive timeline. So this portion of our website features a number of articles about enslaved individuals in a timeline scrollable format. So you can click out to articles uh, or you can click on pop outs to learn more information about important events in American history and also the history of slavery. Uh, and the intent with establishing this site was to create something interactive, 
but also something that would clearly uh, represent the information. So we essentially wrote three types of articles for this initiative. We have more general pieces that provide overview or tie into broader historical conversations about slavery. Uh, second, we have household articles, and these uh, address each president that owned or hired out enslaved individuals uh, at the White House. And this, these uh, articles also help uh, orient site users to time period. And then finally, we have articles about um, enslaved individuals, which to me is the heart of the initiative. This is where we seek to explore the lives of those that have so often been ignored uh, and actually tell their stories. So all of these articles and information can be accessed on our website, which is whitehousehistory.org. And you can get to it by saying whitehousehistory.org slash SPN slash introduction. Next slide. So uh, you may remember this quote from First Lady Michelle Obama when she said, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. Uh, she said this first in June 2016 at the City College of New York commencement. And then she said it again the following month at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. And this statement uh, immediately prompted fact checks by both conservative and liberal media outlets. Um, and many actually turned to our site for more information. And we uh, ended up building this initiative uh, from there. Next slide. So for a little bit of context about slavery at the White House, uh, White House construction in the new nation's capital began in 1792. And for the next eight years, hundreds of enslaved and free African-Americans, immigrant laborers, local and foreign craftsmen, all labored to build the White House. So quantifying this workforce um, has been a bit difficult for several reasons. Um, the number of workers uh, constantly change depending on the time of year, the phase of construction. Um, also, there is constant movement back and forth between the White House and the Capitol building, which were being uh, built concurrently. Uh, then there's also the, um, there was a bit of trouble recruiting workers to help build. So that, that meant that the um, commissioners of early Washington relied on hiring out enslaved individuals. And then also we do have payroll records that indicate enslaved labor was used, but they only tell part of the story. They can help us identify names, occupations, but unfortunately uh, race and ethnicity of workers was not consistently recorded. And this has caused us to look for other context clues, um, including occupation, uh, the listing of first and last names in documents, um, also how somebody uh, was signed for their labor. Did they uh, personally sign an X next to their name to receive their pay? Or in the case of many enslaved laborers, um, the owner would sign for their wages because the wages went directly to that owner. So that leads us to research actually um, more about the, um, the, the slave owners that were signing for those wages. And we have been able to do a, a lot of really cool genealogical research to try and track enslaved individuals from there as well. Uh, next slide. So in addition to uh, enslaved labor used in White House construction, we also know that presidents used enslaved labor at the White House. Um, I have two lists here. Uh, the first list uh, actually excludes President George Washington because he never actually lived at the White House, but uh, he did create the precedent of using uh, a mix of enslaved workers and paid staff to operate the presidential household. And nine total presidents that we are aware of used enslaved labor in various capacities at the White House. So most on this list were already slave owners. Um, they simply brought enslaved uh, people from their plantations or their private homes in the case of someone like Thomas Jefferson um, would have brought people from home. And then our second list here includes 12 presidents that owned enslaved people at some point during their lives. And you might notice some surprising names on this list, including uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Next slide. So to get us started with some of the Monroe related information that we've uncovered related to slavery in the president's neighborhood, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about those enslaved individuals that worked on construction projects at the White House. So I recently had the chance to go through payroll records for work done on the White House grounds during the presidency of James Monroe. And I uncovered the names of 32 enslaved individuals uh, with the help of another historian who takes very good notes, Jonathan Pliska. And these payrolls uh, exist on microfilm within the National Archives, and they detail construction projects on the White House grounds, which took place from about 1818 to 1834. Um, this include, includes grading in the President's Square, which is the area in front of the White House, uh, construction of new walls and gates surrounding the White House, and then coppering of the roof of the President's House. Uh, next slide. 
And uh, this payroll that you see here actually shows the use of enslaved labor. So it's a very similar system to what I described uh, with the construction of the White House. Uh, under this system, free white, free black, and enslaved black people, they all worked on these projects. However, it is possible to determine which uh, of these individuals is likely enslaved. So under this contract hire system, the enslaved person is the laborer, and that's usually listed on the left-hand side of the document. And then on the right hand side of the document is where the owner signs for the wages. So uh, next slide. If you look up at the top closely, I have a, an orange arrow pointing to it. There is a notation for a man, uh, Rich S. Ch uh, Briscoe's Chaz, which is short for Charles. And the fact that this individual is noted as belonging to someone else directly on the payroll makes it pretty clear that Charles was enslaved. So on the part of the payroll where you sign for wages, you can see that an R.S. Briscoe signed and took home a dollar a day for 14 days um, that Charles worked. And then uh, additionally, Matt, uh, my colleague, went in and looked into the congressional appropriations for that year, which um, passed on April 20th of 1818, setting aside $15,214 uh, for these construction projects. So some of this federally allocated money was then used to pay laborers and also enslaved laborers owners. Next slide. Um, and then although it is unfortunately very difficult to trace these enslaved individuals, um, it has been easier to trace their owners. Um, owners tended to be wealthy white men, uh, elites in Washington, DC, and luckily those records have been preserved pretty well, unlike the records of enslaved individuals. So I did some genealogy research, which indicates that Briscoe was a man named Richard S. Briscoe, and he resided in Washington, DC. Uh, and census records like the one here um, indicate that he was living with seven enslaved individuals in 1820, which makes it likely that this is the same person that hired out Charles. And what's most interesting about Charles is that his last name actually appears on later payrolls. So when he appeared again on a payroll in November of 1819, he was recorded instead as Charles Shade, but R.S. Briscoe still signed for his wages. And this recording of an enslaved person's name on payrolls really does vary. So often enslaved individuals were listed with their owner's last names. Um, but while enslaved people may have used their owner's last name, uh, or it may have been recorded that way, they may al also have had their own family names, um, which appears to be the case with Charles Shade. Um, and although no further information has yet been discovered about Charles. Um, I do hope that the that having a last name, which is incredibly rare uh, with this type of research, can potentially allow us to find out more information about him or potentially his family. Um, and as I always like to say, with all research for this initiative, um, it is ongoing and we are always looking to find out more and more information. Uh, but this particular uh, instance of these enslaved workers does give us insight into construction projects that took place on the White House grounds during Monroe's presidency. And uh, I think I'm ready to turn it over to Matt to talk more specifically about James Monroe. Thanks, Lena, uh, for, for that early part of the presentation. And, and, uh, and this also uh, builds upon what uh, Lena already mentioned that uh, our initiative does have these different types of articles and uh, my research focused more specifically on the enslaved households of James Monroe. Uh, Monroe uh, was a slave owner for most of his life. Uh, he, uh, considering uh, how many people are listed in the census records, uh, he was an affluent slave owner uh, over time. Uh, he never quite matched his neighbor, Thomas Jefferson, uh, but certainly, you know, wealthy in his own right uh, in Abemarra County. Now, in, in terms of uh, military, political, administrative, and diplomatic experience, James Monroe was probably uh, the most or one of the most qualified individuals to ascend the presidency in the 19th century. He had fought in the American Revolution and was wounded uh, at the Battle of Trenton. He would served in the legislative bodies of the Virginia General Assembly the United States Senate, and as governor of Virginia, he held diplomatic posts across Europe uh, for multiple administrations and served as Secretary of State and Secretary of War uh, briefly in, in both positions uh, during the Madison administration. And uh, he also studied law, including with uh, his, his neighbor, Thomas Jefferson, they, they developed a friendship. Uh, and later, it's, it's what led to Monroe purchasing 
uh, the land uh, in what is today uh, Highland, uh, James Monroe's uh, historic plantation home uh, in just outside Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this is where the Monroe family primarily lived from 1799 to 1823. And uh, the image at the right shows uh, we have the Highland Estate, but then also the page from the 1810 census, which records uh, 49 enslaved people living at the Monroe property. Uh, it seems like uh, there was consistently anywhere from 30 to 40, uh, and, and in this case, 49 enslaved people living within this community uh, at Highland. Now, there are, of course, uh, many reasons for why conducting this type of research on enslaved people is difficult. Um, and can we go to the next slide? There we go. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, lack, lack of, there's of course the lack of written sources. Uh, you know, most enslaved people were, were not allowed uh, and were never taught to read or to write. And so many of these histories are, are pieced together with a variety of sources like Lena mentioned, or they're passed down uh, through oral histories, uh, through descendants who, who live to the present. And these people become interested in researching their family and their family's histories. Uh, and this is where these connections are made. Uh, and, and the documentation then can help piece these stories together or affirm different pieces of the story. Now, uh, in addition to the lack of a written record, uh, especially of the enslaved person's experience, uh, owners typically only mention enslaved people in passing. Uh, so even though we have uh, the American presidents who have been widely studied, their papers have been preserved and kept, uh, and, and even recently, the Library of Congress just finished uh, digitizing uh, the last large batch of presidential papers and correspondence. Um, for the early presidents who were slave owners, uh, typically uh, mentioning of enslaved people was really just sort of a, a passing. Uh, they didn't go too deep into who they were, what they did. Uh, sometimes they did create more comprehensive lists and, and we can use those to sort of figure out who these people were uh, what they did, the types of work they did. Um, but these are only bits and pieces of the story. You have to rely on other types of material to create a more comprehensive understanding and picture. Uh, so in addition to these challenges, just trying to study the enslaved community and enslaved households of James Monroe. Uh, James Monroe, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, he was moving quite a bit, You know, wh whether it was between uh, serving abroad or moving to Washington, D.C. to serve in different administrations, and then later to be president of the United States. Uh, Monroe was, was a president on the move, uh, and, and in many ways, it, it does make it difficult even to pin down exactly where he stayed or where he was living. And on the left, uh, and allow me to explain this a little bit more, on the left, uh, that is the Timothy Caldwell House. Today is the Arts Club of Washington, located at 20th and I Street Northwest in Washington, DC. Uh, the Monroes lived here while James served as Secretary of State. And as you can see from the rescued bronze relief on the right, uh, it has become part of Inauguration Day lore for President James Monroe. The Arts Club and many other sources uh, have stated that Monroe lived at this house uh, for six months. So from the time of his inauguration until he moved into the White House uh, in fall 1817. However, uh, my research with the help of uh, the papers of James Monroe, in particular, uh, Dan Preston and Heidi Stello, uh, have, have led me to uh, suggest an alternate theory that perhaps uh, there were multiple residences that James Monroe used as president. And therefore, it makes it uh, especially difficult uh, to try to pin down uh, who among his enslaved community uh, had traveled with him to Washington, who had prepared these homes, and who would have been working in these homes. So my research suggests that Monroe actively tried to switch residences uh, and move into the home that President James Madison and First Lady Dolly Madison uh, were still occupying uh, up until April 1817. Now, receipts from the National Archives reveal that money was appropriated, uh, and you can see in the appropriation at the top left, uh, as it reads, for rent and repairs for a house occupied by the President of the United States on April 9th, 1818. Now, by then, James Monroe was already living in the White House. Uh, but Commissioner Samuel Lane uh, had already paid a man named Peter Ham and a woman named Mary Coolidge. Uh, and you can see this other invoice on the right side with uh, the corresponding arrows. There you see Timothy Caldwell's name, uh, who was apparently paid... Uh, by the government, $220 on July 14th, 1817. Uh, that suggests that that was the payment for the renting of the Caldwell House. 
But then you also see Mary Coolidge and Peter Ham, uh, and Peter Ham is being paid a large sum of money, three hundred and seventy nine dollars, uh, which is even more than the Caldwell House. So I, I started to wonder a little bit more about, well, did Monroe actually stay at the Caldwell House? Because it seems strange that he wasn't paying a full year's rent or, or six months worth of rent. And when I found this other receipt, it, you know, it, it suggests, uh, and as it reads, for rent of one of the houses occupied by the President of the United States, 4th of March to the 3rd of October. And, uh, and one of the houses was the phrase that made me pause a little bit because uh, it appears that Monroe actually uh, had two different homes and he was renting two different homes. And the other one belonged to Peter Ham. Uh, so next slide, please. So who is Peter Ham? Well, uh, other documentation supports this theory that there were actually multiple president's houses during uh, the early stages of Monroe's presidency. It appears that Peter Ham owned one of the nicer homes within the seven buildings and had previously rented it to Sir Augustus John Foster, the British minister. The 1820 tax document in the right corner uh, lists Peter Ham owing taxes on square 118. And according to this 1822 map of the city, 118 was the lot where the seven buildings was located. Uh, Mary Coolidge is mentioned in the newspaper listing at the bottom left corner, uh, which says that she has removed the large convenient house in the seven buildings lately occupied by, pres by the president of the United States and it now has it as her power to accommodate members of Congress. Uh, you can see this was November 1817 at the bottom, which suggests she is referring to James Monroe and not James Madison. Next slide, please. So why does, okay, Matt, you've told us a lot about uh, where Monroe might have lived. So why does this matter? Location is key, uh, you know, and it wouldn't have been without Dan Preston and Heidi Stello uh, helping me track down Monroe's whereabouts because we need to, we need to figure out Monroe's whereabouts to figure out uh, where his enslaved household and his enslaved workers would have been. It, it will help us pin down and, and figure out exactly who would have been working uh, within his household as if we can figure out which household he was in, right? Uh, so this rabbit hole of place began with my research in the rebuilding of the White House. And specifically, when did James Monroe move back into the White House? Uh, it started in 2017. Uh, I emailed Dan Preston and uh, in the papers of James Monroe, we shared some information and some ideas. And this collegiality continued as Heidi Stello uh, also shared a key piece of as evidence uh, that supported my theory. Uh, and that was that she had come across a letter that Monroe had written uh, em ending his lease at Caldwell House in April, 1817, which then really does line up with that. Uh, Monroe decided that he wanted to, to remove himself from the Caldwell House and move into what had become the temporary executive mansion. Uh, however, he couldn't just kick the Madisons out of their house on inauguration day. Uh, the Madisons stayed another month. They left in early April to head back to their private home, Montpelier. And then uh, that's likely when James Monroe wanted to move into this new temporary executive mansion because the White House was still unfinished at that time. Now, putting all these pieces together, it appears that Monroe rented Peter Ham's property beginning on inauguration day. Uh, but as I mentioned, the Madisons didn't leave until early April. Uh, so this means that Monroe either expected, desired, or had planned to live in what had become the temporary executive mansion until the White House, which was currently being rebuilt, was ready for him in the fall. Now, complicating this even more is that uh, James Monroe left Washington in late May to go on his tour of the northern states. Uh, so there's also this wrench uh, to throw into the mix that Monroe actually wasn't present in Washington, D.C., as most politicians weren't because Congress was out of session. Uh, most traveled back to their private homes. Monroe decided to go on a tour of the North, and, uh, and there's a wonderful uh, map that you can use uh, the James Monroe Museum has online. I strongly encourage you to check it out, uh, and it gives you a little bit more insight into uh, Monroe's whereabouts in 1817. So uh, when Monroe returned uh, to the White House on September 17th, of course, there was a procession of citizens that took him uh, all the way back to uh, the White House. There was a ceremony, uh, but Monroe didn't stay very long, and then he headed back to Highland, uh, likely because the White House wasn't ready for occupation. Also, the furnishings he had ordered from France still were not there yet. They wouldn't get there until uh, November. Uh, and then he headed south to Highland to gather his family and his remaining possessions. Now, based on Dan Preston's research, it sounds like James Monroe moved into the White House with his family around 1821, 1822. But as we saw with that invoice from the National Archives, 
uh, Peter Ham charged rent until October 3rd. So uh, it's possible that James Monroe's items and personal possessions that were still in Washington were moved to the White House on that date. Uh, Monroe not only brought his family and his possessions with him from Highland, uh, but also a number of enslaved people. And, and this is really the key takeaway from this research, uh, that this group would be responsible for maintaining and operating the White House, which at that time was the largest private residence in the United States of America. And as Lena mentioned, uh, George Washington had set this precedent of using both enslaved and free labor at the presidential households. And typically, uh, you know, slave owning presidents brought enslaved people from their own private homes. And then they mixed them either with free African-Americans uh, or uh, white staff workers, uh, stewards, uh, housekeepers, uh, who tended to have more of a managerial role uh, in these households, in these early uh, 19th century households. Next slide. Now, as you can see uh, from the 1820 census record, uh, it is worth note, oh, actually, I'm sorry, let's go back for a second. I need to go through the names quick, okay. Uh, so we have these names and, uh, and I have them mentioned here for Dan Preston and Heidi Stello. Uh, Heidi was the one who found these names. So uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, she found these in surviving household accounts from President Monroe's first administration located at the National Archives. Uh, the, the papers of James Monroe is currently moving through uh, his first administration and into his second administration. So I would imagine over the next few years, we're going to see some really exciting things published by them. And, uh, and this is part of, those, uh, uh, part of that process of doing the document hunt and finding these types of materials. Uh, and if I'm remembering correctly, uh, Suki, Eve, and Betsy uh, are listed because uh, it's actually part of appropriations for clothing and medical care and Daniel, Tom, Peter, and Hartford are mentioned because of clothing and, uh, and, and I believe provisions and shoes. So, um, you know, up to this point in time, presidents did not have a designated staff. Uh, Congress really didn't appropriate funds in the same way that it does today for the executive residents. And often uh, presidents relied on the people that they owned uh, to operate and run the White House when they served as president. And, and so this group of, of seven people are the ones that Heidi was able to identify and that she was willing to share with us as part of our initiative. Now, uh, obviously we wanna get back to the National Archives as soon as it opens to, to try to find more names. Uh, knowing that there are these names within the household accounts of the National Archives, uh, it does give us hope that we will find more names as we go back because this was just early on in the first term of James Monroe. Next slide, please. Now, uh, it is also worth noting that, uh, and you'll see this is the 1820 census record. So this would have been the last year that James Rowe was, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the last year of his first term really. Uh, so it's really kind of right in between, it's in the middle of his presidential administration. So it does give us a good sense of the size of his household staff, who would have been working there and, and how many people would have been working there. And, uh, and the language it shows us that there were uh, six enslaved people working at the White House for James Monroe. And there were also two uh, free African-American men. Again, this was common uh, from George Washington on, presidents using a mix of free and enslaved staff. Uh, there's also, it's I don't think you can quite necessarily see it on here, but there's also a category for uh, foreigners. And, uh, and we believe that was probably uh, Joseph Jeter, who was the household steward uh, for James Monroe at the White House, um, and then also the gardener. Uh, so having uh, also immigrant labor at the White House uh, was pretty common. Uh, and it wasn't just privy to James Monroe, uh, a number of administrations, especially for the position of Stuart relied on, uh, uh, on French, Belgian, um, and, uh, and British Stuarts uh, to run the White House. So uh, it is worth noting that it's possible that some of the people that Heidi discovered are those listed in this census but it's also possible that they're not uh, because we do have names of those people who would have been working uh, in the Monroe White House early on in his administration. But remember with slavery, people are constantly moving. Uh, they're, they're constantly being moved back and forth. Uh, it's entirely possible that this is a different group of people or there might be some overlap that some of these individuals are actually these ones recorded in the census, uh, but more research needs to be done uh, to confirm and, and try to pin down exactly who would have been there and who might have moved uh, back 
to Highland. Uh, and Heidi and her colleagues, as well as we at the White House Historical Association, continue to move through documentation related to James Monroe's presidency. I expect we will find more people uh, and add them to this list. And it's a good reminder, as Lena said, that this research is ongoing and it will continue to evolve and grow and change over time. Uh, and, and it's especially going to happen, I would imagine, uh, in the next few years uh, as the papers of James Monroe continues to do their due diligence, to do their work, uh, and to find uh, these types of documents that include the names of people. You know, we're excited to work with, with people like Heidi uh, and her colleagues to, to try to bring a little bit more uh, understanding uh, to how enslaved people lived, how they worked, and, and how they really uh, were the heart uh, of, of the operating White House. Uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't just James Monroe, but uh, as Lena mentioned, a number of presidential administrations that relied on enslaved labor. And so uh, as we've seen from this presentation, I think one of the things that we would love uh, to you to take away from this is that uh, yes, enslaved people did uh, work to build the White House. They were involved in, in every facet of construction. Uh, they were involved in the reconstruction after it was burned. But as you can tell, uh, you know, enslaved people continued working at the White House well beyond the initial construction. Uh, they, they worked within the households, whether it was as uh, butlers, maids, valets, footmen. Uh, but then they also worked, as Lena pointed out, on, on government projects, uh, hired out and working on a variety of things on the White House grounds, in, the, in President Square, uh, and also on the White House itself. Uh, and so with that, uh, you know, thank you for joining us this evening, for listening to us about uh, talk about slavery in the president's neighborhood. And, uh, and I'll turn it back over to Scott uh, to see if we have any audience questions. Matt, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Lena, this has been just a, a, a tremendously uh, intriguing project that, um, that has come about um, that, that is obviously um, in some ways just getting started. So it's uh, uh, fascinating uh, to, to see. And we, um, we wonder, uh, uh, or I wonder as we uh, uh, have gone through your presentation, I was listening, so we're starting on, on, on sort of a, a broader macro scale and we can see if we can come down more to, to some specific things about Monroe. You, you had some information up at the beginning that was looking at the Haitian Revolution. They're talking about transatlantic slave trade um, and so many other factors that even though this is slavery in the president's neighborhood, you really had to knit a wide amount and scope of information to be able to tell this story. Is that true? Yeah, I think that, that that is definitely true. Um, you know, originally, I think when we started conceiving of this, we, of course, were focused on the White House, you know, where the White House Historical Association. But in doing that, we quickly realized just how broad it expands. You know, the White House is, uh, it represents the President of the United States, but that means it also represents uh, the, the capital city, and it also represents the broader United States. So we had to bring in all of these different elements uh, and try and um, create this picture. And I think another element of that is the White House is a transitory place. Uh, you only, if you're president, you're only living there for four to eight years. Uh, and then you have your houses other places. And you have, for example, like Mo uh, Monticello, Thomas Jefferson has this huge community of enslaved people at Monticello. Um, he does bring a few of the, those people to the White House, but um, it's it's very transitory. So I think we're you know we're interpreting uh, from a, a broad uh, we you know geographic locations and trying to bring it all together uh, and center it at the White House. Yeah, I, and I think the you know Lena absolutely hit it on the head that uh, you know this this idea that we could confine the story just within the walls. You know, we, we immediately found that, that we couldn't do that. Um, and and it's, re it's really hard to do that with any type of history uh, because, you know, especially when we're talking about people, you know, people move. Uh, sometimes they move on their own accord. And with this story, a lot of them are, are told to move. And so uh, whether it's people that stay there for an entire administration or, uh, you know, for example, like George Washington uh, cycling back and sending people back to Mount Vernon, uh, you know, every six months so he could avoid them being able to uh, gain their freedom staying in Pennsylvania. I mean, the movement of people is, is central to this. And so, you know, being able to tell the story about the history of the White House 
the presidents, the first ladies, the first families who lived there. But you also want to get a sense of, you know, well, who's doing who's doing this work? You know, who's who's providing these things? Who's doing these things? You know, a, a key part of our mission is, is to enhance understanding and appreciation and preservation of the White House. And, and so in many regards, uh, these people, uh, the enslaved and free workers of the White House were really sort of the first ones uh, who were carrying forward that legacy. And so uh, a big part of this initiative is, is to shed more light on them and their contributions, uh, but also to, to help people understand that, you know, the White House may be a symbol, but it, it does have a very complicated and, and complex history behind it. I wonder too, uh, as I'm looking at some of the questions coming in, trying to sort of slice and dice here and, and, and pose <laughs> the uh, uh, effective ones uh, from all the various ones that we're getting, but um, uh, and they're all effective. I just don't want a lot of repetition. Um, are you undertaking the research in a particular chronology or just as, as information comes along, you're, you're sort of feeding it into the hopper? How, how are you approaching it from a, an organization of work standpoint? Yeah, so uh, you know, with, with the launch in February 2020, we, we obviously had some priorities that we needed to get in, uh, you know, in place for that launch. And you know, as we talked about it, uh, you know, obviously, there's some administrations that are better represented. There's already been research. Uh, you know, a lot of good, significant research has been done about, you know, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, George Washington, uh, James Monroe. Uh, so I, you know, part of it was is just getting a sense of everything that's out there, and then how to build upon that and using the White House to do it. So mm -hmm. our initial push was really to get the website ready uh, and to really sort of cover not only what we know already, uh, but then also to add some new research on top of it. And that was really sort of the first phase of this work. And we knew that when we did that and, and we launched it and we added our, uh, by the way, we have uh, an email address. If, if you want to contact us or share your story or share your history, or you have research that you think we'd be interested in, uh, please email us at spn at uh, whha.org and we'll be happy to talk to you and, and email with you. Uh, but we'll, then we've, we kind of figured after that phase that we were going to start having people reach out to us and uh, people that have either, they've done their own research, they've done genealogical research, uh, or we, we have other people that are writing, you know, specific theses or dissertations, or they work at a historic site and uh, they have information they want to share. They, they want us to uh, not only, you know, help buttress what we have, but they also want to improve it. They want to enhance it. And so we're, we're very excited to collaborate with all these different sites and scholars and individuals who are interested in telling their stories. And that's really, I mean, that, that's, that's the linchpin of the initiative is people telling their stories, you know, hearing stories that otherwise haven't been told, have largely been ignored or, 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 or not looked after. And so we really see this as an initiative for people. Uh, so we encourage people to contact us. Now, Matt, you've been with the White House Historical Association about, let me see if I'm good at this, four years? About four and a half. I started on the same day that John Adams moved into the White House. I started November 1st, 1800. <laughs> I mean, but I've lasted longer. So, uh, you know, I've got that on John Adams. You're remarkably well preserved. That's, that's very nice. <laughs> And then Lena, you've, you've come on just a little more than a year ago, about March of, of last year, is that right? Uh, technically, yes. Uh, but I started at the association uh, as a fellow with my, um, my master's program at American oh. University oh. in public history in 2017. So mm -hmm. it's been about four years now. So I'm very excited to be part of it. So did, did the buildup, uh, what was part of that research then, um, was it building toward what is now slavery in the president's neighborhood or or did you come over to this from uh, another focus of your research so i i kind of grew into doing this research you know it, it uh cropped up when i was a fellow and uh i i definitely took it and ran with it and uh was a big part of helping to create this and uh putting together the timeline and all of that so 
I've been involved for several years now and it's been really great. And I'm really excited to see what we can uh, continue to do. Um, you know, as we said, this is only uh, step one and uh, there's a lot more to come. The White House Historical Association is literally in the president's neighborhood, uh, right there at Lafayette Square and Decatur House. And um, of course, you're, 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 under, you're starting this project, you're getting it really off the ground. And as you say, it was in part uh, uh, reflecting what uh, First Lady Michelle Obama had said and the realization of the role of enslaved people in the building and the maintaining of the White House. And yet then also, we have had the pandemic and we have had the social unrest that followed uh, the events of last summer and had a very direct, very traumatic impact on the president's neighborhood, on the place where y'all work, uh, where this history occurred and that you're trying to interpret it. Did that add, a, 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 for, I know for one thing, it, it totally disrupted your actual working conditions. You were off site for a long time, but did the did the confluence of this national emergency and then this other national emergency and trauma have a bearing on how you approach the work or how you saw its significance? Um, I think definitely, yes. <laughs> the, the pandemic uh, definitely changed a lot of things. Um, for example, uh, it, we, as a second step, we were hoping to do you know, a lot more community outreach, uh, community building in, in relation to this topic. Um, working with, yeah, working with other people, descendants, et cetera. And with the pandemic that has sort of been pushed a little bit, but hopefully we'll ramp back up into that. Um, and also I think that the, the conversation that's occurred in the past year has really, um, it's, it's a, I feel like we were, we came out with this initiative at the perfect time. I'm glad that we were able to help provide context about slavery at the White House um, and uh, be part of this uh, moment. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, I would say the, uh, in addition to what Lena said, you know, to have this launch and uh, to have all these different research leads that we wanted to follow, uh, but then the National Archives closed and uh, the Library of Congress closed, it's, it has slowed, uh, you know, our research uh, a little bit, but, you know, I, I do think that in light of everything that's happened over the last year, um, the timing was right. And, and to have that content out there and that context out there and to have really one central place where people go learn this story and it's easily available, accessible, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's not really limited by, you know, you don't have to pay for a subscription or anything like that. It's, and I mean, it's there. And I think it was just, it was good timing. Um, but I think as we move forward and as things start to open up again, you know, we're, we're excited about all these possibilities because we've had people reach out to us and, and we really had to just suffice with email and Zoom calls. So we're, we're excited to, to get to see people in person, get to talk people, uh, get to know people in person, because I think that's really, that's, that's a key element of this that uh, unfortunately we haven't really been able to have, but, you know, we're optimistic that, you know, this year it's turning and, uh, you know, in the next six months or a year, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to, to meeting people and, and discussing this more. We're getting several questions that are, and, and I, I sort of in, in filtered in one earlier, but I, I guess I want to address this um, for the audience as much as for, for y'all. Um, we get a number of questions that sort of touch on the relevance of this research to modern society, present day mm -hmm. uh, social, political, cultural issues. And I think it's worth noting that White House Historical Association is by its creation and operation apolitical and strives very hard to focus on its historical interpretive mission and to not, um, certainly intentionally, uh, carry its work into a, a contemporary uh, political dialogue. And that's not to say people don't have opinions, that they don't uh, see the, the relevance of what they're doing to contemporary issues, but that's, it's the mission of the White House Historical Association to provide a lens into the past and, and to help provide historical perspectives that can inform people in, in how they see the present or the future, but not to take positions. Did I navigate that? Uh, correctly in terms of how y'all approach your work? Very well done. <laughs> Thank you, okay. 
Say something to the boss about that. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we're getting down to James Monroe a little more specifically, and uh, we're, we're, we're still we're fine on time, so uh, we, we hope questions keep rolling in here. Um, as you noted, uh, Monroe not only was moving uh, the, the residents around a little bit, had his portmanteau ready to take to this place, to this place, he went on the road. He took the show on the road, literally, uh, to the northern states um, to start that really popular tour that would give us the era of good feelings term and, and all the rest and, and be wildly successful so much so that he would keep doing it twice more. Uh, but while he was away, and, 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 even, and even while he's there, I know that Monroe was very hands-on in the restoration of the White House and the operations. We're not as sure, uh, and perhaps y'all have something to say about Elizabeth Monroe's uh, role, the first lady's role, but um, when he left and was spending those months on the road um, in 1817 and later in 1819 uh, when he toured the South, who was overseeing, directing, uh, uh, interacting with the enslaved workforce? Was it Mrs. Monroe? Was it someone else? Was, um, Samuel Lane was around for a little bit, but he had the whole district and then he died. So who, who was there uh, working with uh, these folks when president is not? So uh, there, there is one instance that I recall uh, Heidi Stello sharing with me and it was, uh, I believe that Monroe had sent some of his enslaved servants back to Highland. Uh, they had uh, come to DC to help prepare a house. And in the conversations that I had had with Heidi, we were trying to figure out, well, were they, were they preparing Caldwell House? Were they preparing a different house? And my research seemed to suggest that it wasn't uh, Caldwell House, that it was perhaps Peter Ham's house that Monroe wanted to rent. Mm -hmm. um, but that they were sent back, and that would make sense that they were sent back right around the time that he left DC to go on his tour. So uh, I think in that particular instance, and I would imagine many presidents did something similar, uh, if, if they weren't in the immediate vicinity uh, and they didn't have a, an overseer, a manager, or a steward present necessarily within the household, that they would uh, send their enslaved workforce back to their uh, private home or plantation. Here again, trying to cover several questions that kind of bear on the same thing, and, and, and your use of the, of the pronoun there helps you know, emphasize this. The presidents in the, in the period in which you're studying, and this was true well into the 19th century, um, uh, were responsible for maintaining their own households, their own official households. They, they received a salary from the government, uh, but no uh, expense allowances. So. Uh, the, the enslaved people there were not considered the property of the White House of the federal government, per se. They were the private owner, uh, private property of those presidents who, who were slave owners. So um, uh, I just was trying to clarify that a little bit, that there were some people asking, did the enslaved remain there after the president's term was over mm -hmm. or something like that, or who decided what their jobs were and their working situations were. It's very much president to president how they defined how that all functioned, right? Yeah, it's really it's really interesting in that aspect. Like uh, the the households do change over. We have a couple instances of an enslaved person that uh, stayed for multiple houses. For example, um, uh, there was a man named John Freeman who worked for. Uh, he was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson, uh, but then John Freeman actually fell in love with a woman that um, belonged to Jefferson's daughter. Uh, and then they ended up um, moving the, she was freed at one point, she ended up in Washington, DC. And at the end of Jefferson's term, uh, he, um, uh, John Freeman actually writes these letters where she, where he directly asks Jefferson for his freedom so that he can remain in the district um, or he wants to be sold, sorry, not his freedom, but he wants to be sold to uh, James Madison so that he can stay in the city with his wife who was free. Um, so that's a really interesting um, example. He, he did work in James uh, Madison's household. And then there was a terms of contract. He was freed after a few years, I believe in 1815. And then he lived the rest of his life in the district and became a pretty prominent free black, black family. Um, so I think that there, there's not a lot of overlap. There are a couple instances like that. But yeah, you're right. Um, for the most part, enslaved people are coming with the president. Um, the, and then a lot of presidents relied on enslaved labor because of the fact that uh, they just had this stipend. So the government's not paying for the work done in the house. They're the ones that are allocating that. So 
they brought um, they brought the enslaved labor so that they they would save some money in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's very it's very much a uh, it's very much a modern thing. You know, people look at the White House today and they think of the executive residence staff, um, and maybe people even saw this uh, recently. A, uh, a White House butler retired after 47 years uh, working between Blair House and the White House. And uh, I mean, like that's a, it, it's, it's, that's become sort of the story of the White House, but the idea of staff staying through administrations, I would say is much more of a 20th century onward uh, type of thing when, when it became more and more uh, of a, uh, they were putting government employees in these positions. And so, Prior to that, um, it, it was it was incumbent upon the incumbent uh, to provide money for his own household. That meant, uh, you know, the expenses, the food, the drink, uh, the staff, and that presidential salary is not what it is today. It, it did not go very far, um, and I think even early on, you know, that was something that, you know, George Washington, you know, was wealthy enough that it it didn't. It didn't matter as much, but you know, for John Adams, that became an issue. Uh, Jefferson, there is some debate whether or not it, it was more convenient, or just Jefferson had a general preference uh, for for having enslaved cooks, especially uh, working at the White House. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it wasn't. It was usually an issue of money, but not always. Sometimes it was because these enslaved workers, you know, they knew the president and first lady. They knew what they liked, what they didn't like. And for them, it was just, it made more sense to bring someone from their own household who already knew all of these things uh, and, and to do those things at the White House as opposed to paying someone. Now, Jefferson also had a, an interesting line where he said he, he liked paying people because then he could fire them uh, if he found them unsatisfactory. So mm -hmm. again, it just kind of goes to show you that it, even with people that we think as, you know, like Thomas Jefferson is the, the stalwart of the slave owning presidents, even he used a mixed staff and, and differentiated between enslaved workers and, and free wage laborers. Well, and, and I think it goes beyond the scope of, uh, of the time that we have tonight to, to discuss, but uh, there, there's, to me, a very intriguing uh, question I have on the relationship between, you know, you, you have this tradition and this repetition of an enslaved workforce, and as you mentioned, an immigrant workforce, Mm -hmm. um, almost from the beginning of the, or really from the beginning of the White House, and then even past the era of slavery, mm -hmm. um, there is the tradition of a largely African American staff, many staying for those those long periods, you know, backstairs at the White House, Ike Hoover, uh, uh, and then the other staff who are coming in also, um, and then others who are uh, immigrants in some cases who are perhaps white. Uh, and they they together form a workforce that becomes very attached, very associated with the White House, I think is both a status. And I don't know the degree to which you might, is, is there any relationship of formerly enslaved people who had been at the White House coming back to work in a free capacity? Do we know if that occurred? Um, I, don't think I mean, the, no, the, uh, the story that comes out to mind uh, to me was, I, I think Andrew Johnson uh, had at one point Andrew Johnson was a slave owner, uh, but uh, but then slavery was abolished, and mm -hmm. and he brought, I believe, uh, some of his formerly enslaved people to work at the White House. Uh, yeah. So he would have been, he would have been paying them to work in the White House. Um, but you're absolutely right. It, it does seem like there's this uh, there's this tradition that emerges that. Uh, working in the White House symbolizes something important and significant, and uh, whether it's uh, African Americans or or immigrants, uh, that they're really sort of drawn to to this place. And uh, and even as you get into the latter half of the 19th century, uh, I, I was recently doing uh, some research on doorkeepers. Uh, for those of you out there, you're like, what is a doorkeeper? Uh, it, it's sort of the 19th century version of the ushers. And so uh, this became a, a government, more of a government job, I think in the 1860s, probably around the Lincoln administration. And a lot of these individuals either fought in the Civil War or uh, they were part of the Metropolitan Police Department of DC. And they ended up being assigned a, product, a productive duty at the White House and, and they turn into these doorkeepers, which are really the early iteration of, of, uh, of ushers. 
And some of them are, some of them are from Germany, some of them are from Ireland. Uh, some of them are from, you know, across the United States. You have somebody from Virginia, somebody from New Hampshire. So, I mean, it really is in some ways, it's sort of like a melting pot of, of different types of people doing different types of work. And, uh, and you know, we, we hope to build upon slavery in the president's neighborhood uh, to, to, to not only talk about the stories of, of free and enslaved uh, African-Americans, but also uh, to keep going, to keep telling people stories, uh, you know, beyond the end of slavery. And I misspoke earlier when I was talking about like Hoover, I meant to say Eugene Allen in terms of, you know, mm. I'm serving African-American uh, staff. Um, we have a number of questions that uh, are, have involved wanting to know more about the enslaved workforce specifically of James Monroe. Uh, I would encourage people to go to um, uh, search for the papers of James Monroe at the University of Mary Washington's website, as well as also the James Monroe Museum, our, our institution uh, there. Um, we have done uh, and are continuing to produce programming on various aspects of James Monroe's uh, relationship to slavery as an institution and as a government uh, and political matter as much as his personal situation. Um, the papers of James Monroe in covering uh, broad aspects of his personal and official life are, are full of a lot of that uh, information as well. Um, at highland.org, you can see the work that our colleagues at James Monroe's Highland have been doing. Uh, and not only does it involve looking at Monroe and uh, the historical evidence of the enslaved, it involves working with the descendants of some of the enslaved population at Highland uh, who have formed a descendants council. And they are very much as a family taking on this, this subject uh, with its significance to them within their community and within their place in history. So there's some really exciting stuff. Uh, there's been work by um, uh, uh, researchers in Loudoun County, um, uh, Lori Kimball, um, um, uh, one of the folks that's really helped bring to light some of the information, uh, information about the enslaved um, at Highland, uh, not Highland, at um, Oak Hill, uh, the Loudoun County uh, home uh, that uh, Monroe also had. So we are in sort of a renaissance of research. And if you could provide your uh, website address again, so that people can be sure to, to look at slavery in the president's neighborhood. Yes, it's at www.whitehousehistory.org slash SPN slash introduction. Excellent. And um, that uh, I can assume will only become more uh, comprehensive and gain more uh, information, um, and I assume will also be a, a launching point for other um, uh, sites as well, links to other resources too? Yeah, so we, uh, uh, one of the things we do want to uh, do with the initiative is not only to shed more light on these stories, but also to serve as sort of a nexus point for all these different places that are doing this research, uh, but also the individual scholars and historians and so, uh, for example, if you if you go on our website and you read about James Monroe's enslaved household, uh, you'll see uh, that there are links, you know, links out to other sites that are doing similar work. Uh, there's, in, you know, there's links to the papers of James Monroe. There's links to uh, Highland. So, uh, and even the articles themselves, they sort of end by acknowledging not only these other sites and places that are doing this research. But we also want to give credit where credit is due, and uh, and you know we we are really focusing on this sliver of time, right? It's it's James Monroe's time in the White House, which he got off to a rough start because he couldn't move in right away, uh, which I think which I think bothered him. Uh, but you know it's really that seven and a half years of, of James Monroe's presidency, and that's really that's what we're focusing on. But we also know that by zooming in on that seven and a half years. This is going to involve collaboration with all different types of people in different places who are looking at uh, this particular source base, who are looking for these people who can help us shed light on who they are, what they did, and how they contributed to White House history. Um, well, thank you uh, for, for that and for the work that is ongoing. Um, I also, I mentioned Lori Kimball earlier, and I'm, I'm, I'm catching up my mistakes here. Lori Kimball and Wynne Saffer, also involved in that Loudoun County research. So again, credit where, where credit is due. Um, 
there is also, um, and, and I know we, we, we try to keep uh, focused on our time here, but we've got, um, if y'all are okay, we've got so many uh, other ones that are popping up. I'm trying to, to stay um, on top of them. Um, uh, one question was, is there any specific information about the enslaved's jobs and interests and skills? And I think we've shown, you've shown uh, that through uh, the staff of the papers, your own work, that you're combing a lot of different sources to try and match people and occupations and outcomes of, of that work. And um, uh, how, how do you feel in terms of what you have found and what you think there could be yet to find? Yeah, um, I think it all depends on who we're talking about, right? Because, uh, you know, we have um, somebody like Thomas Jefferson takes a lot of notes about everything and he has, his papers are really robust. So, you know, and, and they've already, and then a lot of people have gone through them. So, you know, I'm not sure that there's that much more we'll learn from that. But then you have a lot of other individuals that are really mysterious uh, where their papers aren't as intact or um, the later slave owning presidents have been less covered. For example, um, I wrote an article about uh, James K. Polk's White House and the fact that he purchased enslaved children um, consistently throughout his presidency, um, not for the White House, but for his plantation back home um, in Mississippi. So, you know, you have a lot of different, um, different people involved in some things, you know, I, I definitely think, oh, there's a lot more here that we don't know yet. And maybe we can read sources in different ways and find more information. Um, when we get back to the archives, there might be more, but then there's others where I think maybe we have a better sense um, and we're able to tell more stories because we have more sources and we can say this person did this as an occupation. They also had this as their family. So it really varies, I think. Yeah, and I, and I would just add to that, that, you know, the, the unsung heroes of this are documentary uh, editors because, you know, between the papers of James Monroe, the papers of Andrew Jackson, uh, the Martin Van Buren papers. I mean, we, we consulted with all these different entities. And uh, I don't think most people probably don't realize the, in, the intensity of the level of detail and research that these individuals do. Uh, they just sort of see the published volumes. They just see the final product. Uh, but these are individuals who know the primary source evidence better than anyone else. And so, you know, anybody who's interested in researching specifically uh, you know, about really anything related to those individuals, you know, the papers projects are the place to start. They're going to at least be able to get you in the right direction. Uh, they're they're going to have some insights about what you're looking at. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I think also a big part of this research is just, uh, you know, being open-minded because, you know, you might find something and it's pretty startling. Um, and it's, it takes a while to sort of come to terms with it. And uh, for me, you know, I, I remember reading about Andrew Jackson purchasing a young girl named Emmeline, and I have a daughter. And so for me, that that was really, it was hard to read uh, that, that he purchased this little girl and, and to think about it as a father. And, you know, that's that's what we want people to to experience when they when they think about this history, when they read this history. It should be more personal, not impersonal. Well, um, there, there are a number of questions that have come in that I'm, I'm going to uh, beg off uh, tackling because of time and also because they are in many ways covering, they're showing a very great interest in James Monroe and the enslaved people uh, with whom he interacted, uh, both uh, in his personal life as well as at the White House. And to, to not go too far off the topic that we were having tonight, I encourage people, as we said, to look at highland.org, look at... Um, James Rowe Museum, uh, uh, umw.edu. That's our James Rowe Museum website. And um, Tim McGrath has published the most recent mm -hmm. comprehensive volume, a one volume biography of James Monroe. That's uh, you can get it on the online store of our museum or Amazon or wherever you like. But James Monroe, A Life is uh, about this thick and it's got a lot of uh, very contemporary research in it on, on all aspects of Monroe's life. And that will help with some of the general questions I think we've been asked tonight. Uh, Lena Mann, Matt Costello, thank you so much for your time, for your uh, sharing of this wonderful work that you're doing and for the uh, leadership really the White House Historical Association is taking in this regard. Um, we enjoyed having you with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to our viewing audience.
Good night.